Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop. Generative AI is everywhere, but it can be intimidating to get started. There are a lot of options available and more coming out all the time. So choosing which AI platform to use can be pretty daunting. In today's workshop, we'll go over some of the basics of using generative AI, including what it is, how it works, some tools that are available. Um, and you'll also work hands-on with one AI tool later on in the workshop if you want to, so that you can practice some AI prompting while creating text or images. So we'll get started. I'll be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Hirsch and I'm the Assistant Director of Teaching Excellence and Support in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. I've been teaching college writing and literature for over 16 years and I've been with CIDL for over five. Before joining CIDL, I started my journey at NIU as a graduate teaching assistant in the English department where I earned my master's and PhD in English while teaching first year composition and literature survey courses and advising English majors and minors. I'll take questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. So if you have specific questions related to what we're covering, feel free to post your questions in the chat thread and I'll address them as I come up or you can hold off until the end. And I will turn off my video just so that I don't have any bandwidth issues. All right, so workshop objectives. By the end of the workshop, you will hopefully be able to explain the basics of AI, address ethical and privacy concerns, explore applications of generative AI in education, begin to use effective AI prompting, and start a plan for an AI strategy. First, I wanna start with just a few statistics from some surveys. Um, so Pearson did a student survey of AI use in the spring of 2024. And um, some of the ways that students use AI are to get better grades. 54% said that they use it to get better grades. 56% um, to be more efficient. 44% uh, to walk them through tough problems. And that number goes up to, or percentage goes up to 51% for STEM majors. Uh, the highest use of AI was from 9 to 11 p.m. among students uh, in the survey. And 60% of students were interested in trying new AI tools. Um, from a survey of grads on AI from high, inside higher education in July of this year, 70% said that basic gen AI training should be integrated into courses. And 55% said that degree programs didn't prepare them for work, workplace tech tools. Um, and then for employers, they believe that grads should have foundational knowledge of Gen AI, 62% said that, and 58% were more likely to interview and hire those with AI experience. So just a little bit of information to get us started before we talk about these AI basics. So first of all, what is generative AI? Um, algorithms basically that can create new content such as text, images, music, and more based on the data that they have been trained on. So let's break this down. Um, algorithms, web-based computer programs uh, can create, so it, it'll predict the most likely results by analyzing existing content and applying programmed rules to that content. So it's not actually creating anything, um, it's predicting results. And then based on data, so they have vast libraries of human generated content, including books and other published works, websites, photographs, artwork, video and audio recordings that um, the AI is trained on. So it is trained on human generated content. Some additional vocabulary to know machine learning is an algorithm that identifies rules and patterns in the data to build models for decision making. Uh, large language models or LLMs are artificial neural networks that detect the statistical relationships between how likely a word is to appear following the previous word in their training. Training data is a library of content used to train the AI, potentially without the creator's knowledge or consent. And intelligent tutoring systems are a digital learning platform that gives instant and custom feedback to students, and it can be used for adaptive learning. So um, some faculty may be using adaptive learning courseware, for example. Um, chatting with AI. General use generative AI tools use a conversation metaphor. So you write a prompt and AI responds to that prompt. Prompts are the instructions that frame the requests. So good prompts include a task, what you want the AI to create, the format, what the output should look like, 
voice, what the language should sound like in context, additional information to define the conditions. And we'll go a little bit uh, more into AI prompting a little bit later. Um, but let's talk about a few tools. Uh, if you attended last month's workshop, we went into tools a little bit more in depth. Um, I'm going to give an overview of a few tools, um, highlight a couple of new ones that we didn't uh, address last month, and then just highlight the ones that we have um, access to here at NIU. Uh, so the top are general use chat-based generative AI tools, OpenAI's ChatGPT 4.0, Claude Sonnet 3.5, Microsoft Copilot, free version, and Gemini. Um, and then we've also got Perplexity, Pi, Goblin Tools, and Adobe Creative Cloud and Express. So one that we didn't really talk about last month was Perplexity. This is an AI search engine. It provides sources for the information it presents. It accepts text, file upload, and images as output or as input, generates text, ProSearch uses advanced AI models to engage in meaningful dialogue by showing how it breaks down your question and then how it performs that deep research. Um, and focus mode allows you to choose the types of sources that Perplexity uses um, to inform its answers. Um, one tool that I wanted, we did talk about this last month, but I wanted to highlight it again um, just because I, it's a, an interesting addition. Uh, it's called Goblin Tools. It's designed for neurodivergent users by supporting productivity. Uh, the web version is free or it's $1.99 on mobile, at least as of um, last month. And um, some of the key features include task management, breaking down tasks into manageable steps, uh, writing improvement tools like the Formalizer and Judge that help refine the tone and formality of written content. Um, uh, there's a mad, you know, the magic to-do list. You can add a new item and then you can select the magic wand icon to break it down into multiple tasks. Um, so this is something that students can use, but it's also something that we can use as we're, uh, you know, scaffolding learning for our students too. So if we want to know, you know, how can I scaffold, um, this particular major project or assignment, this might be a tool that you could use to help with that. Um, but it's also something that you might want to to try out and then maybe suggest for your students if they have some issues with um, executive functioning or prioritizing tasks. Um, something else that uh, was piloted at NIU in spring of 2024 and is now available to all NIU faculty is the Blackboard AI Design Assistant. Um, so it, it assists us in course design by suggesting prompts for assignments and discussions, creating rubrics, generating test questions, suggesting learning mod modules, and creating images for course content. Um, Adobe Creative Cloud and Express, also available to NIU faculty and students, incorporates Adobe Firefly's generative AI features. So that includes text to image generation, genera generative fill, content extension, and audio editing across their uh, Adobe apps. And then Microsoft Copilot, which we'll take a, a deeper dive into, into today, um, is available to all NIU faculty, staff, and students using your NIU account ID. And it features um, commercial data protection. So this is the one tool that um, ensures that user data and chats aren't used to train the AI. And we'll talk a little bit more about privacy in just a little bit. So how have you used, and you can you know, pop some ideas in the chat, how have you used or encountered AI in your everyday life? So this can be you know, in your role um, as faculty or staff, but it can also just be AI in your personal life and everyday encounters. Just drop some of the ways that you encounter or use AID in everyday AI in your everyday life. Great, we got some ideas coming in um, to write an adoption bio for a foster dog making emails and proposals more concise, travel itineraries, um, AI-generated content comes up when you Google something, uh, refining assignment prompts or discussion boards, creating 
group names for advisory councils so they sound inviting, a youth sport parent letter, coming up with outlines, uh, real time in class and uh, citing an example from the real world. So using students, uh, having students use AI to come up with applications, um, creating flyers, posters, uh, interacting with chat bots, uh, having students use it in response to classroom tasks, quiz questions. Great. So there's a lot of AI out there right now. Um, some of the things that we maybe didn't mention, but that we encounter all the time, um, uh, uh, Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, those are all smart assistants. That's AI. Um, as someone already mentioned, Chrome browser um, comes up with AI content at the top. You can also say, help me write, and it will, uh, in your Google search, and it'll help you um, AI will help you write something, um, come up with ideas for writing. Um, social media, like my AI chatbot on Snapchat or TikTok's creative assistant. Um, and this doesn't even mention algorithms that drive content recommendations as well, right? So we encounter AI all the time. It's everywhere. So let's talk about how we encounter it in education, how it applies there. Um, so we shared this last month. Um, this is a Jenna Gen AI intent and orientation model. Um, so we've got instructor assistant, instructor proxy, learner proxy, learner assistant, instructor assistant, um, instructor uses AI to plan a learning activity. Instructor proxy is where instructor guides students in using, um, providing a prompt or AI powered bot that students interact with to learn. Uh, learner proxy, student uses AI to communicate with the instructor. And learner assistant student uses AI to create tools that help them learn. So we shared some examples of this last um, month, but I'll share some different examples. And the instructor assistant ones are ones that are actually my real life examples. Um, but you're a college English professor. You need to create instructions for students for an, an in-class brainstorming activity for pro project two prompt attached. So I attached the prompt for the project um, to give the AI some more information about what I was looking for. Um, so I could come up with a more detailed um, brainstorming activity. Um, another prompt that I gave AI, create more details for the following activity, including an example, controversial argument and example responses. So I give it a prompt of here's the activity, now flesh out some of the details. Um, and this was for an argument response practice assignment. And then it gave me some more details and then I refined those. Um, based on the class and the content. Um, instructor proxy, um, so you could also use um, artificial intelligence to um, act as a proxy for the instructor. So you can give your students a prompt like this to have them interact with um, AI with you, a proxy for you. Um, so a prompt example would be, I like to understand the concept of theater of the absurd more fully. You'll ask me questions that encourage me to think deeply and explain what I know in my own words. You will help me clarify my understanding, identify any gaps in my knowledge and solidify my grasp of the, of the subject. Remember, you should ask specific questions to push my understanding. If I can't answer, ask additional questions that may help me. Um, learner assistant. Um, so this is uh, so these are some examples of ways that students could ask AI to come up with some some assistance for them in their learning. So develop a set of flashcards for Tagalog vocabulary related to homeschool and transportation. Help me outline an essay on engineering issues and the integration of electric vehicles into the power grid, focusing on major arguments and supporting evidence. Uh, help me brainstorm topic ideas for a five minute podcast episode on the history and impacts of the electoral college on voting in the US. So the, the possibilities are, are endless. Let's talk about, before we get into some limitations, concerns, ethical issues, um, what are your concerns about AI? And you can go ahead and uh, again, drop those into the chat. <laughs> Data privacy, definitely a concern. Over-reliance, replace learning. Uh, faculty are always worried about cheating, true. Yeah. 
Any other concerns? Uh, that will replace creative thinking, uh, independent thinking, problem solving. <clears throat> Marketing begins to look like everyone else's that asked the question. DEI issues. Great, keep them coming. Um, so let's talk about some limitations and concerns. Um, and these aren't exhaustive, obviously, but we'll get into a few. Bias um, kind of hits on that DEI issue too. Um, generative AI can replicate the human biases from the content that's used to train the algorithm. Um, so this can create those diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Um, hallucinations, as Diane mentions, false and misleading information. Generative AI doesn't know things. It's trained on content. Um, and sometimes when it doesn't know things, it provides inaccurate or misleading information, um, just makes things up. Um, the use of generative AI requires critical evaluation and verification of AI generated information. So, um, you know, there's some great use cases for AI, but we also need to be careful with the content that it um, produces and that we're verifying that content and critically evaluating it. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, some of the the bias issues that might arise in, in generating um, images, for example. Um, I talked with my students about um, this. I There's a, a multimodal project that was done asking AI to depict certain uh, cultural groups, ethnic groups in different periods in time uh, taking selfies. And all of those selfies, this is an example, this, the images on the screen are not those selfies, but you can look this up um, and I'll send, find the, the link for you and send that to you in a follow-up email. But um, the selfies were not representative of the culture. So it was, you know, uh, very skewed towards the American version of the selfie, you know, big beaming smiles, regardless of the situation. Um, or the content, and then they kind of paired those up against actual images um, or depictions from those uh, those groups in those periods of time. Um, so we just need to be aware um, in both when we're asking AI to generate content, um, but also um, images of what its output is um, and what biases might be inherent in that. Um, Deanna mentions that there's also the issue of free versus paid AI, which could lead to greater inequity. That's a great point. Um, Google's Gemini has this disclaimer. Um, so this highlights the those issues. Um, Gemini will not always get it right, may give inaccurate or offensive responses. Uh, when in doubt, use the Google button to double check Gemini's responses. Gemini can use extensions to connect you with useful content. Gemini apps may share parts of your conversations and other relevant info, like your location with other services. And um, you can respond and flag anything that may be offensive or unsafe. But those are some, some concerns. And there are similar concerns with other platforms too. Um, accessibility might be another concern. Um, so you want to, you know, when you're asking students to use or when you're using uh, generative AI yourself, you might want to search for um, an accessibility conformance report or voluntary product accessibility template, BPAT, um, for that uh, generative AI tool. Um, another potential accessibility issue that could arise out of AI, our response to it is the instinct to restrict class activity out of fear of academic dishonesty, which could make your course less accessible to students with disabilities. Um, so for example, um, you know, if you're so afraid of, of AI cheating that everything has to be on paper um, in the physical classroom, that could be um, an accessibility issue. Uh, let's talk about ethics and privacy concerns a little bit more. We talked a we touched on it a little bit with that Google Gemini statement, um, but some key ethical questions 
around the use of AI or how will student data be collected, stored, and used by the AI system? What information or data should not be provided to an AI system? Um, does the AI system have any inherent biases that could disadvantage certain student groups? How can we ensure equitable access and outcomes for all students? Um, how will faculty maintain control over pedagogical decisions? And could over-reliance on AI hinder important skill development in students? How do we balance AI literacy with student independence? Um, so we'll, talk, we'll take a look at a few terms in privacy uh, statements from some of these tools. Uh, Gemini, Google collects your Gemini apps conversations, related product usage information, info about your location and your feedback. Uh, GPT-40, um, in that second bullet point, when you use our services, we collect personal information that is included in the input, file uploads, or feedback that you provide to our services. Um, Adobe Creative Cloud, this is from Doit's um, FAQ on their, their webpage about Adobe Creative Cloud and how to use it. Um, but one of the questions is, can faculty and staff store university data classified as highly restricted on Adobe's cloud-based storage? And the answer to that question is no, because Adobe Cloud Storage has not been approved for data that falls into the highly restricted category. And I've got the link there about uh, data classification and, and what highly restricted would mean. So if you want to take a look at that, you can go to that link and I'll send that in a, my follow-up email as well. Um, so for information on what is considered highly restricted versus restricted versus non-restricted data, see those data classification guidelines and procedures. Microsoft Copilot, though, um, our 365 license at NIU provides faculty, staff, and students with commercial data protection. When you access Copilot and sign in with your NIU account ID. So there are four primary benefits of that protection. Searches in Copilot are not linked to individual user accounts. Prompts and responses are not saved. Chat data is not used to train large language models, LLMs used by AI, and no one at Microsoft can view your data. So that's um, something important to note about Microsoft Copilot. Um, if you plan to have students use um, AI in your class or if you plan to use it in your classes and you have any concerns about student privacy or your own privacy and data being used. All right, so let's talk about some um, prompt engineering tips. And these I've um, summarizing from MIT, I'll send you a link to their full page. Um, but prompt engineering is input to AI systems for generating specific results um, or conversation starters for AI interactions, in other words. Um, so this is the prompts that we put into whatever the search bar is to get results from generative AI. Uh, it can be simple, a phrase. It can be complex, multiple paragraphs long. You can also um, attach files in some generative AI tools. Um, some models hand a, handle multimodal inputs, so text, images, and audio as well. Um, how does AI respond? It adapts based on prompt details and tries to use natural language processing and machine learning. Some strategies for prompt writing include um, providing context, so adding background information, specifying the desired perspective or voice, so way back. Um, in that one prompt that I shared, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, of the the role uh, or perspective that I wanted the AI to have an English professor um, teaching, and sometimes I'll give them, you know, the class that I'm teaching, teaching X class. Um, to be specific, include precise details, time, location, set clear tasks, examples, rules, and constraints and then build on the conversation. Use AI's ability to remember context. So if it's within a single conversation thread, it'll remember the context from, from earlier or should remember the context from earlier in that same conversation or thread. Um, and you can refine and iterate on previous responses. So I do this often. Um, I don't usually take the first thing that, that it's given to me. So I'll say, okay, can you ex expand on this part? I don't like this part, take that out. Um, and then kind of work with it to refine before you go through and make your own re revisions afterwards too. 
Um, so some limitations, um, there's flaws, there's potential for fact factual inaccuracies. Um, there's AI hallucinations, which are, you know, something that's coherent. So it, it has a coherent output, but the information in it is false. This often happens for me when I ask it to cite sources or to come up with a list of articles or resources for a particular topic. Um, you know, sometimes if I can't come up with a, a resource, it will just give you fake sources or fake information. Um, and it's, you know, kind of interspersed with real information. So you really have to, to take a look at that. Um, potential harms is perpetuation of biases. So there's an MIT photo controversy. Um, a student used uh, AI for professional headshot, um, asked AI to, to create a professional headshot from a selfie. And uh, AI turned this Asian student white with big blue eyes. Um, so I'll post a, a link to the Business Insider article about that. Um, so it might perpetuate these biases. Um, and there are challenges in producing inclusive language as well in AI. So some key takeaways, um, quality of prompts impacts AI output. So the quality of your prompt is going to affect what AI then communicates back to you. Um, but also we can't, a quality prompt does not, um, isn't a, in a, um, alternative for critical evaluation of AI responses. So you need to have both. You need to have quality prompt, but also you need to critically evaluate what the response is from, from the AI. Um, okay, so I wanna do just a little bit of a demo of Microsoft Copilot. Um, and if you wanna go to the NIU page on Copilot with some information about it, um, it's go.niu.edu slash Copilot. Um, and what I'd first like to do is have you all kind of brainstorm some prompts for me, and then I'll just choose a random one and I'll put it into Copilot and see what comes out. So if you wanna plop a prompt, good, bad, whatever, uh, into uh, the chat, I will just choose one at random and I will put it into Copilot. And then as soon as I have one, I will start sharing um, my screen. Got some rolling in. And if I don't pick yours, I'm only gonna pick one, um, but you'll get a chance to, to do your own searching too in just a minute. But I would just wanna do it as a, a whole group first. I'll give another minute for some brainstorming and typing up some prompts there. <clears throat> All right, so some great ideas here. I'm gonna pick the last one, which is because it's very meta, provide a guideline for undergraduate students on acceptable and unacceptable uses of AI in the classroom. So let me just share my screen. And... I 
I will paste that there and I'll click submit. Let's see what happens. All right, so we've got a nice long response here. And one nice thing about Copilot is that when you get your first response, it'll give you some suggested questions that you can ask it, um, some follow-up questions. Um, and I love the little disclaimer there, AI-generated content may be incorrect. <laughs> um, so it's got some acceptable uses, unacceptable uses, and best practices here. We would want to go through and read through them and see whether we agree with them or not. Um, we can ask a follow-up question. Um, can you uh, can you provide examples of acceptable and unacceptable uses in specific scenarios? So let's let's uh, ask that question. So we've got some scenarios of writing paper, preparing for an exam, a group project, a research paper, class discussions, accessibility needs. And then it's got some more um, prompt questions there. You can also uh, like it, dislike it, copy the contents, you can export it, you can have it read aloud to you as well. Um, so some some useful tools there. Um, down at the bottom, you can also start a new topic. So this is one thread, but if I wanted to start a completely new topic, um, then I could do that. Uh, it's giving me some, some random topics there that I can take a look at. <clears throat> All right, so what I want you to do now is to go into Copilot. So you can go to copilot.microsoft.com and you can put your own prompt into Copilot. Uh, make sure that you're logging in with your um, NIU information. So sign in with your work or school account so that we have that data protection enabled and you'll see this uh, shield up in the right-hand corner for um, knowing that your commercial data protection applies to the chat. So let me stop sharing that. <clears throat> and I'll have you go to copilot.microsoft.com, try signing in and try, and I'll put that in the, the chat too, and try your own prompting and see what, what happens. And I'll catch up with the slides here while you're doing that. So I'll go back just a second um, to the prompt writing strategies again. So again, provide some context, be specific and build on the conversation. So what's the context? Some background information, is there a desired perspective or voice that you want? Um, give some details, set clear tasks or constraints and use the ability to remember context to refine and iterate on previous responses. And to answer your question, yes, you can access it from O365, you would click on the um, apps tile at the at the, the top, and then you'd click more apps, and Copilot should be under more apps.
and you can click on it from there. And you can also pin it if you want to your apps so that you can access it more easily. And once you've had a chance to play around with Copilot a little bit, um, share some of your thoughts in the chat. You don't have to share the responses or your prompts, um, but what are your thoughts on it? How might it be useful to you? Or what are still some of your concerns? That's a great point. Uh, you can go back and edit a prompt that wasn't as good as you thought it was. <clears throat> so for a new topic, um, you click that blue, there should be a blue speech bubble. And when you hover over it, it'll say new topic. <laughs> Asked it to create a low-fat, low-sugar recipe for cheesecake. Yum. Just mail me a, a piece of that cheesecake that you baked tonight. Oh, as part of the prompt, you asked for it to create a downloadable PowerPoint presentation. How did that go? Okay, so when you created it, it took you to Bing and gave you an error, and you had to log into Bing with your NIU credentials also. Gotcha. That is good to know. Another nice feature is the ability for it to create a Word document based on whatever I asked it to create. That is really nice. It's very useful. All right, uh, I asked it to create an image of diverse people in a specific setting. Then I asked to add at least two people with various disabilities since none were featured in the first image. It then depicted everyone in a wheelchair. Yeah, so sometimes it um, it might go a little overboard. Um, and sometimes, you know, I found uh, when I've tried to ask it to create very specific um, images, it doesn't do a great job at that, at least not yet. 
Um, so, you know, wanting to create, you know, a diverse group of people in a particular setting. So sometimes I'll, I'll create images um, for, you know, banners of modules in my online courses to give my students, you know, some something um, representative of what they're going to be learning about that week. Um, and I do try to be cognizant of, you know, diversity, uh, including disability. And sometimes when I'm trying to be very specific in what I'm telling the AI to do, um, this is particularly with with Adobe, um, it doesn't always get it right. And sometimes I need to massage the results a little bit, refine them, and try to get it to, to where I want it to be. Other thoughts or reactions to your prompting? <clears throat> um, you can add a file to uh, Copilot. So if you look at the uh, where it says ask me anything in the Copilot, there's a little paper clip um, icon where you can add a file there. Um, it does have a limit of one megabyte. So just so that you're aware. So you might need to condense a file if it's bigger than that. <laughs> I asked it to create a song about squirrels and it came up with the next big hit of the season. <laughs> I love it. All right, so keep playing around with it. Um, you know, figure out what its use cases might be for you, for your students, um, and you know, keep going with that. Um, so just a few thoughts. <clears throat> yeah, that is a good point. It, it keeps your earlier iterations. You can go back and do other edits of, of previous um, versions, which is great. Um, so. A few um, thoughts on reframing AI in education. Um, as we move forward with AI, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, as we saw at the very beginning with those statistics that I shared um, from those surveys, uh, AI in some way is going to be expected as a um, skill set, uh, using it as a skill set that both students and their future employers are going to expect from them. So we want to move beyond just AI prohibition, but we don't want to just kind of jump in feet first either. Um, so document and reflect on your AI usage. Um, we want to promote critical thinking and personal insights about AI use. We want to prepare students for AI in the workplace, but we want to prepare them in a responsible and an ethical way. Um, and put those thoughts in their mind too about, you know, when is it ethical or when would it be ethical to use AI in the workplace? Um, what additional work would you need to do with the AI output in order to make it um, more, more useful for, you know, your project at work or, or what have you. Um, so prepare students for encountering AI in the workplace, but also with using it effectively um, and uh, showing them that AI isn't going to do the job for them, knock on wood, um, but that they can use it as a tool and how they can use it as a tool and how they can improve on it. Um, we also want to avoid adversarial student instructor dynamics. Uh, so I think that uh, in some cases we've, ha we've seen this happen where 
uh, faculty might be so um, concerned about AI cheating that they're hyper vigilant about it. They're using AI detection tools, which there's a whole other ethical um, issue with the use of those tools and uploading student um, records like their assignments to those tools and the privacy concerns there. So, I mean, we could do a whole workshop on that as well. So, you know, there's, but uh, there's also issues with those tools being um, ineffective um, or inaccurate in flagging AI usage um, and particularly inequitable in those um, those outputs. Uh, so for example, a report just came out from Common Sense Media that um, Black students are twice as likely to have their work flagged as AI generated than white students. Um, we've already seen data that uh, students for whom English is a second, third, fourth, you know, not their native language um, are more likely to have their uh, writing flagged as AI generated as well. So we want to promote responsible use of AI for our students um, and give them those, those guideposts and those guidelines um, and uh, teach them about the ethics of AI use um, and how it is allowed to be used in our classes, how it's not allowed to be used, why. Um, but we also want to demonstrate responsible AI use ourselves too. All right, so I want you to come up with an AI strategy or plan moving forward. So start thinking about what your AI strategy or your AI plan is going to be. Um, and this can be a first step. This can be, you know, maybe you've already been playing with AI or already been using it, but now you want to go further with that. Um, so what's your strategy or your plan moving forward? Think about it for a minute. And then if you feel comfortable sharing any of those thoughts, um, in the chat, please do so, so that we can all benefit from them. Great, thank you. Continue guiding students in acceptable and unacceptable uses of AI throughout the course, as well as help them, as well as myself, build skills in AI use. Excellent. Create an exercise similar to what we did in this workshop to help students see additional value in what AI can provide. Excellent. Um, I'd like to learn more about the various AI platforms and the features. I've been encouraging my team to use it as a time saver when documenting notes, especially with email communications. I also encourage them to use it when creating a plan of action or drafting an email or narrative. I'm wondering if there's a university or college level AI policy. I do not believe that we have a university level policy. Right now it is up to you know, individuals, um, individual units, individual instructors, of how they um, want to uh, restrict or allow AI. We do have an AI toolkit. Uh, let me find the link to that. I think it's on our next, maybe on our next slide. Yeah, so um, on our next slide, I have a, a toolkit to share with you. Oh, thank you, Nicole. Um, so yeah, there's, 
there's samples out there, um, syllabus statements, um, but we don't have a mandated um, or university-wide policy at NIU. Thank you, Lindsay, for sharing the, the link for the syllabus statements. Any other strategies or plans moving forward that anyone wants to share? And if you're, you're typing, keep, keep going. I'll just share this uh, AI resources page here and outline some of them. So we have an AI quick start guide there at the top. Um, there, we also have a, a PDF shared on AI hacks for educators. It's a, an ebook. Um, we, uh, there's the AI assessment scale that was, uh, created about a little less than a year ago by Leon Furs, um, and updated recently, um, within the past few months. So there is a blog post there about that. Um, and I'll send these links to you in my follow-up email for those of you who are here, um, today, um, generative AI literacy definitions. Uh, chat GPT adoption and its influence on faculty well-being and empirical research in higher education. Um, there's a, a scholarly article there. Um, effective prompts for AI, the essentials from M MIT. Um, and then Wharton has an AI Horizons webinar series and an AI education research. So there's a couple of links for those there. Western Michigan University has some resources in, on AI um, in a Google document. So that's uh, shared there. And then workshops on AI and teaching from our CITL. Um, there are recordings and upcoming workshops that'll be listed on that page in our toolkits under AI workshops. So you can see workshops that were delivered. Um, you can uh, access the recording from last month's workshop. Um, we had a couple of workshops in the spring that were faculty panels. Um, those links are there. Uh, they're, they're, the workshop recordings are there. Um, and then we have another workshop coming up next month. Um, if you have any questions, please post in the chat. You can use the microphone as well. I'm just going to post uh, or bring this up. We have an upcoming workshop on AI next month. Um, it is on October 23rd. It is called LLM uh, 101 and Dr. David Gunkel, pre Presidential Research Scholarship and Artistry Professor at NIU um, and the author of the recent AI for Communication is going to deliver this workshop. It'll be in person. Um, our location is TBD and registration um, will be sent out in our October workshops newsletter from CIDL. So keep an eye out for that soon. Um, it'll be LLM 101 will be a non-technical introduction to the technology of generative AI, along with an overview of the opportunities and challenges of these innovations. So keep an eye out for our, our October workshop flyer email for this workshop that's coming up at the end of October, as well as others. Um, so if you have any questions or um, concerns, you can contact me. But also, if you have questions, we have a few minutes left. You can pop any questions in the chat if you have any um, but thank you so much for attending. Um, and uh, again, I'm Dr. Hirsch, Amanda Hirsch, call me Amanda, um, for Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. My email address is up there. Um, and again, I will later today be sending out a follow-up email to everyone who attended today with um, all of the links um, and resources that I've mentioned throughout today's presentation. Um, and you can always, if you think of a question or a concern, um, you can always respond to that email at that time. Um, and I'd be happy to help you out with anything um, or answer any questions that you have. So uh, have a great rest of your day. Um, hopefully you were able to eat some food <laughs> during the session or have some time to, to grab something to eat afterwards um, to sustain yourselves for the rest of the day. Um, and again, thank you so much, everyone, for attending today, and I hope to see you at some of our future workshops.